I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade. Cue the music. This drunken little German monk is intoxicated with himself. Sober him. Lighten, Lighten up, up, Francis. <laughs> I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade, a weekly theological podcast where we grab an ice cold beer, sit down at our table, and talk about theology. You can find me at soundcloud.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade. You can also find me on YouTube. My YouTube channel is 1517 Films, where in every episode there, I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash. 1517 films but this this is lutheran lemonade to make glad the heart of man as wine was given as a gift of god that gladdens the heart of man the true wine the gospel gladdens the heart of man and on this episode of lutheran lemonade we are doing a bit of a hymn study i think the season of Lent is fast approaching. It is next week. We're coming upon Ash Wednesday. And if you get the chance, I'll put a link in the description below. Grab a look at the episode on 1517 Films on YouTube that I just did on Ash Wednesday. It's an incredible episode. It was a lot of fun to make and to talk about the history and the heritage of Ash Wednesday. And what I think I omitted, that uh, ashes... Um, are very ancient in the church and uh, part of the repentant process for the earliest Christians, but the imposition of ashes on the forehead in the sign of a cross is a relatively new uh, tradition. So you'll get to know me quite well, and you'll realize that I, I stand on liturgy and history and tradition, but every now and then there's a really good brand new one that comes in, and it harkens back to something more ancient in it. It's worth embracing so check out my episode on ash wednesday but for this lutheran lemonade we're going to do a bit of a hymn study we're looking in the lutheran service book where are we looking at hymn number 430 oh my goodness i am blind without my glasses hymn number 438 and that's in the bold print a lamb goes uncomplaining forth by paul gerhardt a very old middle ages hymn it's a hymn of the season of Lent. Now, why am I doing a hymn study? Well, if you watch the video that I did on Ash Wednesday, you'll, you'll realize very quickly that I think the focus of, of Lent is repentant joy. Uh, I, I get kind of the Protestant understanding of Lent that um, maybe it's just this gloomy, sorrowful time where we give up, I don't know, meat on Fridays or... We uh, quit smoking for 40 days, or we, we just do this stupid little tradition of men to make ourselves feel more righteous. No, 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 no. Lent is a season of repentant joy because, sure, uh, the time has now come where tears for sin must flow, but uh, uh, sorrow um, for sin, focus on the suffering of Christ, and of course, the embracing of Christ's own words to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. Um, but the joy comes from the understanding that Christ bore the cross for us. And so there is joy even in the season of Lent. And I think a hymn that paints that picture beautifully is Paul Gerhardt's uh, hymn, A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth. Now, uh, the lamb is a beautiful, rich rich thread woven through the tapestry of the scriptures from, I think, I believe, from Genesis. It doesn't say it, but I firmly believe it was a lamb that God slaughtered to cover the shame and sin of Adam and Eve. And the, the lamb that Isaac asks his father, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Do not worry. God will provide the lamb, those beautiful prophetic words, the lamb of the Passover that was shed, that was killed and blood shed covering the lintel and posts of the door so that death would literally pass over God's people. And of course, in the Gospel of John, John the baptizer 
pointing to Christ and saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the people hearing it, knowing about the Lamb, the one that the priest would speak the sins of the people over and send out into the wilderness. And of course, uh, the Lamb for the sacrifice, because without the shedding of blood, there is not the forgiveness of sins. And we know this from all the way back in Genesis. So let's start. Verse 1, a Lamb goes uncomplaining forth. A lamb goes uncomplaining forth, the guilt of sinners bearing, and laden with the sins of earth, none else the burden sharing, goes patient on, grows weak and faint, to slaughter led without complaint, that spotless life to offer. He bears the stripes, the wounds, the lies, the mockery, and yet replies, All this I gladly suffer. Verse 1 of a lamb goes uncomplaining forth. And there could, we could have a conversation about how the hymnody of the church is substantially better than anything that a modern praise band could come up with. But I think we're going to avoid that conversation and just let the hymn speak for itself. This lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world is going uncomplaining forth to the cross for the joy set before him, the Bible says. And he doesn't go uncomplaining in the way that we would go uncomplaining. Well, fine, I won't complain. I'll do it and I won't complain. Oh, how how humble (laughs) you are, oh man. No, he literally goes uncomplaining forth, this burden gladly bearing, desiring to do the will of the Father. And yes, uh, Christ in his human nature, asking the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, is there another way? But the the preeminent words, not my will, but thy will be done. And the 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 oh this this um the guilt of sinners bearing and laden with the sins of earth, none else the burden sharing. Laden with the sins of earth. The guilt of sinners bearing this burden. No one else can share. This is for Christ alone. So while there was help for him in carrying the cross and getting him to Golgotha, he bore by himself in his flesh, carried the sins of the entire earth, all mankind, the entire brokenness of creation. He bore in his flesh and while bearing that sin and that condemnation he goes patiently through it but he grows weak and faint but still to that slaughter led without complaint his spotless life to offer that lamb without blemish he bears the stripes the wounds the lies the mockery and yet replies all this i gladly suffer why for you. The lies, I think, it took lies to get Jesus convicted, and Jesus was convicted for telling the truth, for bearing witness to the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and he bore witness to himself, to his mission that he is sent from the Father to bring the kingdom of God, to bring the forgiveness of sins, and for that truth he is condemned, and standing there silently as a sheep before the shears is silent. Again, another lamb analogy. This lamb of God that goes forward, patiently enduring not only the lying and the scourging and the mockery and the nails and the suffocating and the dying, but endures patiently and gladly bears the sins of the whole earth. Verse 2, this lamb is Christ, the soul's great friend, the lamb of God, our Savior, whom God the Father chose to send to gain for us his favor. Go forth, my son, the Father said, and free my children from their dread of guilt and condemnation. The wrath and stripes are hard to bear, but by your passion they will share the fruit of your salvation. It's important to understand that God the Father sent forth his Son, chose his Son for this task, commissioned him, sent him. Sometimes 
I'm told, I've not seen it, but I'm told that there's this idea that God the Father is angry at you and Jesus is the love of God that comes and steps in and says, no, 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 Father, punish me. Mm. Mm. It was the will of the Father to crush his son. God sent his son. John three seventeen. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, that the world might be saved through him. God sent the Son. And we see a little bit of this divine conversation from the person of the Father and the person of the Son. Go forth, my Son, the Father said, and free my children from their dread of guilt and condemnation. The wrath and stripes are hard to bear, but by your passion they will share the fruit of your salvation. And there, there's a conversation to be had about fruit and whether or not we have it now or whether or not we have it in a little bit. But this sending of the Son from the Father, if you want to know, God the Father loves you. God the Father does not delight in the death of the wicked, but rejoices with the truth. God wants to save all of mankind and sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law in the fullness of time he sent forth his son for the sole purpose of bearing in his flesh your guilt your shame your sin and enduring patiently joyfully gladly and uncomplaining your condemnation in your place this is how god feels he loves you and sends his son to redeem you. Verse 3. Yes, Father, yes, most willingly I'll bear what you command me. My will conforms to your decree. I'll do what you have asked me. O wondrous love, what have you done? The Father offers up his son, desiring our salvation. O oh, love, how strong you are to save. You lay the one into the grave who built the earth's foundation. Now, uh, going into this where the Father is speaking and sending the Son, and the Son replies, the last thing we hear of the Father, by your passion they will share the fruit of your salvation. So there is, was a tree in the garden, a real tree, a living tree which brought forth death because it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And to eat the fruit of the tree, to choose to be the one who decides and knows the, the difference between good and evil and not God, this living tree that brought death. But now this dead tree, the tree of the cross, this dead tree, upon which hangs living fruit. I forgot to mention that. And we participate, we eat the living fruit that hung from the dead tree of the cross. Don't we take this and eat it? This is my body, which is given for you. Take this and drink it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. We, like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, are now eating again the fruit of the tree of life. Because in the garden was the tree of life, and if you eat that fruit, you never die being barred from the garden of Eden. Now we have access again to the tree of life, the life-giving fruit of the cross, Christ's body and his blood. Verse 3, the son replying that he willingly will do and bear what his father commands him. I will conform to your decree. I'll do what you have asked me. And then this beautiful phrase, O wondrous love, what have you done? The Father offers up his Son, desiring our salvation. O love, how strong you are to save. You lay the one into the grave who built the earth's foundation. You see again here the will of the Father who desires your salvation and the Son conforming his will to the Father, desiring nothing but your salvation. 
It is indeed true that while he endured the sin and guilt of all the earth, if it were only you, he would still have done it. And this beautiful ending of the hymn, you lay the one into the grave who built the earth's foundation. You see, John in his gospel credits creation to Christ because God created by his word, didn't he? God said, let there be, and there was. Jesus Christ is the word of the Father made flesh. Jesus Christ is the creator of the whole earth. And he who stretched the land across the waters now outstretched his arms on the cross, and he lays in his death a new and firmer foundation than the foundations of the earth. He who laid the foundations of the earth is laid in the depths of the earth in death in your place. And he bears in his flesh your death. And you are buried with him into that death, aren't you? By baptism, we read in Romans 6. He participates you into that death and into his resurrection by raising you to newness of life. This this. Can you see it? The joy, the absolute repentant joy. Sorrow over sin, yes. Admission that the guilt is mine and the whole earth, yes. But the clear gospel message that God the Father chose to send forth and crush his own son in your place to the sole purpose of his desire to save you. And he who created the world is now laid in the depths of the earth. The last verse. Lord, when your glory I shall see and taste your kingdom's pleasure, your blood my royal robe shall be, my joy beyond all measure. When I appear before your throne, your righteousness shall be my crown. With these I need not hide me, And there in garments richly wrought, as your your own bride shall we be brought to stand in joy beside you. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm, I'm aging myself again. But I remember The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when it was re released by Disney. And those big old puffy jackets. And I get a lot of this. I studied. Uh, um, Tolkien and or not Tolkien. Well, I did study Tolkien, um, but C.S. Lewis and philosophy, the Chronicles of Narnia and philosophy. I studied this in college. These big, big coats. These the, that looked like robes on these children. They were robed. And then at the end, when they're brought forth by Aslan after the great battle and the final victory. And there, in the presence of all the people, robed and enthroned. We are a royal priesthood, the Bible declares. Why? Because those robes were richly wrought. The blood of Christ is our robe. It is our righteousness. It covers our sin. It removes every blot and stain and transgression. And it's the only thing we can plead before the Father when we face the final judgment. We can only plead the blood of Christ, which alone avails for us. So you see it here in this final verse, the joy that rings forth. When your glory I see and taste your kingdom's pleasure, your blood my royal robe shall be my joy beyond all measure. When I appear before your throne, your righteousness shall be my crown. With these I need not hide me. There's no fig leaves. There's no hiding from God. Because for the sinner, to be in the presence of God is to be in fear and dread. It was for Adam and Eve. They heard the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. It was for Isaiah... It was for Moses, it was for all the prophets who recognized the presence of God and immediately became painstakingly aware of their sin. But in the presence of God at that final day, robed in the royal blood of Christ, 
We dare not hide ourselves any longer. We stand boldly and confidently with absolute joy, don't we? And there in garments richly wrought as your own bride shall we be brought to stand in joy beside you. If you think that Lent is simply a time to look sorrowful and put on this pious puss face and to cover yourself in ashes and flaunt whatever it is that you've given up in front of everybody, you don't understand the joy of the season of Lent. Certainly sorrow, certainly reflection on sin and on death and on the suffering of Christ in you, for you and in your place. But this joy is the joy of repentance, this repentant joy that Christ, the Lamb of God, without complaint, for the joy set before him, went patiently, willingly, gladly to the cross for you. And if this message doesn't gladden the heart of men, then I don't know what message is. I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade.